fits in a quote. But uh, still, the point is that we're going to be talking about ownership today within the context of Rust. And it is, in fact, a very powerful, I would say, tool and not a weapon. Um, and if you're working on a coding team, then that can be very powerful as well in terms of uh, maintaining a code base and reasoning about whether it's correct or not. And that's uh, it's a big benefit of what we're going to be talking about today. So for the most part, you can ignore this slide. So yeah, today we're going to be talking about borrowing, references, and ownership. These are all very related concepts in Rust. And um, so we'll be going to explore uh, the relationships between them, um, how uh, borrowing and references are sort of talking about the same thing, and how our ownership relates to these other two concepts. So you can say these are similar and relate to the concept of ownership. So to begin with, before we talk very much about what this is, we're going to just mention a few benefits of the system. Um, the uh, REST ownership model ensures that there will be no data races in your code, um, given that you follow safe Rust, which uh, you will do unless you explicitly tell it not to be safe. So don't worry about that for now. But um, the compiler can basically ensure that there are no data races in your code because of the strict ownership model. It can also guarantee a very good runtime speed by default because um, you will not uh, suffer unnecessary copies, for example, uh, unless you explicitly ask to. And for parallel and concurrent processing, uh, the ownership model is actually very powerful because, for example, with no data races, you can now write parallel code with a little bit more trust that your code is going to be correct, even by just relying on the compiler. In other languages, you often have to manage these yourselves. Uh, you still have atomic references, and you can still still have to deal with stuff like this in Rust. But uh, it's uh, it's easier to reason about what can go wrong because of the compiler and the uh, the strict ownership model. Uh, and finally, of course, safety, which is a big point of using Rust in the first place, um, by ensuring that so that variables are like they, that they belong to their owner and that values are borrowed securely or referenced securely you will avoid common problems such as null pointers um, dangling references uh, you will not modify data that is also read elsewhere so you will not have data corruption like that um, and how this works that's what we're going to look at today as well and some annoyances, especially if uh, no matter if you're a senior developer or a junior developer, when you start with Rust, you will probably face this. So you might have to rethink some of your solutions. So code that might work well in C or C++, where, which is also systems language, which is why I'm uh, comparing to that right now. Um, there you can basically do whatever you want. The compiler will mostly just notify you about syntax errors. Um, so, uh, so while you would have been allowed to do something there, Rust will basically tell you to get lost and not allow you to do it here. Um, I don't know if you started recording, but that's OK now. Yes, I started. Yeah, OK, good. Uh, so some solutions might have to be thought out differently, but in the end, this is a good thing since it will uh, result in safer code. And it can be also very frustrating to fight the compiler as a beginner because you will have really weird errors. You will have to deal with a lot of compile errors and warnings since um, it is very strict. It's a lot stricter than actually most other compilers I've ever, <laughs> I've ever faced myself at least. So you will, you will feel the urge to close your IDE or just, you know, do some weird hacks. But then the weird hacks will also probably have a complaint. So then, then you're going to be even more frustrated. So, but in the end, it's going to help you write correct code. 
that uh, can be reasoned about and you can sort of trust it if it compiles you can feel pretty safe that the program is going to do what you expect it to do assuming of course your logic is correct so we're not going to do this right now um, but let's we're going to do start with a quick example uh, i might want to increase the font size if it's not okay Um, let's see. Is that readable? Yeah, it's it's huge. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. There's a chat as well. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to just leave the chat on the side of the screen. Okay, yeah, so let's start with a quick example. So you had seen, looked at some of the basic uh, basic syntax with Marius yesterday. So let's do a quick example that we all think should work fine. I kind of gave it away that it will not work, but um, coming from other programming languages, this is something that can be confusing. So if we start by creating a name variable, and we say that this should be a string from the string literal. Let's say, yeah, we're gonna say Mario here. And then we create name two, and we want that to be the same as name. That sounds reasonable. And then we want to print these values. Uh, we have this guy and this guy, and that's name and name two. So if we run this, um, we will face our, oh, that's the wrong file, of course. Let's see. Let's see draft file. Draft. Yeah, so we, we get a compile error. And this could be an error that you might get a lot. And what exactly does it say? So it says that the value is borrowed after a move. And that's name. So we can no, the name variable uh, cannot no longer be used here, uh, which breaks the program. So this assignment means that only name two now is a valid use of this string. So name is invalid here. And the compiler is going to tell you about this. And uh, that's something that's different from most other languages where you could be able to just assign it directly. So a reason for this, let's go and have a quick detour, is that we're going to look at how the string uh, works. So if we have the value Marius here in a string, then the string type in Rust basically contains it's a pointer first to the value, which points to the first letter. Then it holds a length, which in this case is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's the length of the string. And it has also a capacity. Um, now, when we do a copy of this, um, it does not actually allow a copy. So there are two ways to copy it normally. And that means either uh, we take a copy of both the value and of the string type that wraps it. So we have basically two of the same string. So we basically have Marius twice in memory, and we have this one twice in memory. Another way is to have clone just this thing and have this thing point to Marius again and just be a new box. Then they share the same memory and uh, this is not allowed in Rust. So that's one part of the ownership model is that you cannot have two owners of the same memory. So when you have, so when we assign this string here, um, let's see, when we assign this string the second time, 
we actually we don't get the the doubling of the data like so like this that we might expect um and we don't <clears throat> get the other one where they both point to the same data in fact um this sort of stays unchanged and uh, instead we just have name to sort of take over the variable from name and name becomes useless at this point so we're no longer allowed to use name because name is no longer a valid variable um, and to understand more about this we are going to have a quick discussion about stack and heap and some of you already started answering uh this one and that's going to be quite relevant so let's have a quick look so stack variables they if you had operating systems or not i'm not sure uh, how the core structure works right now but if you create an integer 10 if we create a float uh, 2.05 all of these variables are assigned and created on the stack. So we can also then do, let's say that y equals x, and we can say that uh, g equals f. And like we would expect here, x, y, and g, if we print everything here, we can print x, y, f, and g. And we get all of the values. So this is not technically different from what we just did. Because if you remember with the string, we just created a string and then we assigned it to another variable. Uh, so we're, we're going to get back to that in a second. So, and if you also know about stack, uh, let's uh, just do a quick note of things that are relevant here. Uh, so all variables that are on the stack here, they have a fixed size known at compile time. So an integer ni32 will always be 32 bits or four bytes. So it, the, the compiler knows how much memory it needs and it just pushes it to the stack. Uh, and that's the second part. Um, variables are allocated by pushing popping so it's basically a last in first out list that you probably discussed with Frode in the first year uh, you basically put the a variable on top and then when it goes out of scope it gets removed and it's so it's super fast super fast to allocate because it's always you just push it to the stack you always know where to put it and you all know exactly how much size it needs and it you know it at compile time so uh, the compiler will just put it there. So a weakness here is, of course, you cannot use it with dynamic, uh, cannot use with dynamic types, dynamic collections. So if you have a vector or a string that's going to grow, you cannot push it on the stack because you don't know what size it's going to have uh, throughout the code. So, but if we just create s as well we can, we know that for hello world this is a string literal so uh, we know that this will always have this size and the, the, therefore is, you also see that it's a, a stir a reference to a stir which um, is different from a string but uh, in that this is a literal it's not dynamically allocated it's always hello world it will never change and this is stored in the in uh, uh, it's not stored on the stack technically this particular piece of string this is actually stored in the data segment of the program which is like a special part of the executable that just holds uh, for example uh, string literals uh, other constants that basically become static pointers in the program um, uh, this will be discussed in operating systems probably if, uh, if you've not already heard about it um, Let's quickly then go to heap. So as I mentioned, dynamic collections 
including strings, which is technically a dynamic collections collection of characters, um, cannot be on the stack. So if we create a street proper string from, for example, string from hello world, this now has to allocate the, and this has an implementation detail of the string, this now allocates on the heap uh, the, enough memory to hold hello world. And then the variable itself, like we briefly looked at, I know this drawing is probably horrible and I should not have tried to do it. Uh, holds a pointer to the string and the length of the string and the capacity, which is the amount of memory that the cur string currently has, which means if you want to grow the string, the capacity will have to increase with the length, but the capacity can always be greater than the length in case there's some pre-allocated memory, but that's not super relevant for this discussion. Uh, so the heap is slower to allocate since we don't have it on the stack, we don't know exactly where we need to go. We have to ask the operating system, hey, where I need exactly this much memory, uh, can you give it to me? And then uh, ask OS, and get pointer to memory. So in C, you would have used uh, malloc for this and free. Uh, heap is also lifetime of memory is in the, can be, independent of calling scope of the scope that created it. So this basically means that heap memory can live between multiple function calls. It can be created in one scope and then be just live throughout the entire program if you wanted it. Uh, whereas stack variables exists only in this scope unless you copy them or move them around. Um, also, a big important thing is that you can dynamically change uh, reallocate, which is what string does if you uh, changes its size. And uh, so this allows for dynamic containers. And another way to create this, we have a vector, for example, of uh, integers. Since a vector is a dynamically growing collection, this is a piece of uh, dynamic memory on the heap. And finally, we also have uh, just anything. Say we want a just an integer on the heap, int heap. Oops. Uh, and box is the most primitive way to allocate something on the heap. It basically, uh, I would say this is as close as you're gonna get to malloc on Rust because you obviously don't touch memory the same way because in other languages you have, you have the concepts of um, actually allocating and freeing. Here it's a bit more tucked away, but that's also to guarantee the ownerships, so. Uh, another very important thing about the heap is that uh, one allocate means one free. You can, you should never allocate free memory twice, um, and you also always have to free it. Otherwise, you have a memory leak, and uh, that's something that the ownership rules are going to be very helpful for. Yeah, I mean, yes, you do have alloc A on the stack, but. But yes, <laughs> that is correct. Okay, so uh, let's quickly do this one if you're in the Menti. Mm -hmm. And this one actually should be last, so ignore this one. Oh, it says voting is closed, okay. Well, my bad. So now let's take a look at the actual ownership rules. 
So each value in Rust has a variable that will be its owner. There can only be one owner at any given time. Uh, and when the owner goes out of scope, the value will be dropped or it will cease to exist. So in, if you've done C++, this can sort of be tied to a destructor, the concept of a destructor that will destroy uh, the variable or the class whenever it goes out of scope. Uh, the fact there can be only one owner at a time, that's what we saw when we tried to copy the string and use it. So if we said string, string two equals string, uh, this is when we fought that rule since by assigning the string directly here, we now take ownership. So on heap values, the default assignment actually is not a copy, it is a move. So moving the value means that we take whatever this thing, this variable owned and say now it's string two that owns it, which leaves string as something you can no longer use. So that's, that's part of this rule. Um, however, for most of these stack variables, uh, since they're on the stack, they're so fast to allocate. Usually they're very small. They're very fast to copy as well. So in this case, the default actually is to copy. And uh, uh, for, for example, the integer x, this means that afterwards we can keep using x even if we assigned x to y. It just creates a copy of the value and uh, we can use both of them after. So we can also, and the, in te technically that me means that all the, the default values like the literals and the uh, scalar types, they implement something called a copy trait. And that, allow, that basically means that the default operation for them when you assign will be to copy. And any value or a class or a struct, or well, just a struct, that uh, has a heap value can never implement the copy trait. So for all of this, all of these types, they can have, they cannot be copied, and uh, that's why you get the move as the default. If we wanted to get the correct or the expected behavior here, like say we wanted the string and string two to just actually be a copy of string, then we would have to call clone first, which will take clone the string and that then you get, um, well, the second scenario where you have two of each box, if, but I'm gonna close this one. And then you would be allowed to use both of them, A and B. Then, you use, then you're allowed to use both. If we did not clone, then you would get the error that uh, uh, the move occurs because the string has type string and it does not implement the copy trait. So, and since it implements, uh, has a heap value and implements the drop trait, then it can never have the copy trait. So you can't have a heap value that is both copy and drop. And the same would go for the vector and the box as well if we try to do it with those. So if we quickly look at the two different string types that we have access to, it's, uh, it's the ref to string, and which is immutable. Uh, you can never change anything through this one. Uh, it is preferred as a function parameter because you can use it with both the string and the other string class. And uh, it's for the most part uh, stored directly in the executable data space. So if we had two strings that had the same value, technically they would be pointing to the same memory since uh, this would both, that would just exist once in the executable, but uh, that's a minor detail. Uh, yeah, and this is what I was trying to draw for the regular string. Uh, I probably should have left it to this slide since it's a lot clearer here. Uh, it's like std string in C++ if you've used that. Uh, except, uh, and unlike this reference to string, uh, it can be mutable and modified. It can grow dynamically, it can shrink dynamically, you can change the values, 
as you want. And the length and capacity can grow and change as well. And this one is allocated on the heap. And you can also create them dynamically, which means this is what, what you're going to need to use if you want to deal with user input. You cannot have user input directly into a reference to a string or reference to a stir. But you can have user input into a string since, uh, since uh, you don't know the size at compile time. So you can, you can basically dynamically change it. So let's uh, move on to a bit more about borrowing, or let's start introducing it. Um, I have another file prepared here with some examples. So if we look at these examples for a bit first, uh, we can make things a bit more clear. So um, these are first some examples for creating strings and the references true. So since this is just a string literal, you just assign it to a quote of strings. And it's immutable. It's limited what we can do with it. And strings, you can create them in several ways. Um, you can use string from, which we used in the other file, and then you just put the string literal in the parentheses, and this is basically a, a constructor that just takes a string and allocates it enough space in the heap and puts it right in there. You can create an empty string, which is string new, or you can do a string literal and call dot to string on it, or you can do maybe this is more clear and call dot to owned. Um, so this is at this point, it's a style choice. Um, to own expresses more clearly the intent that, hey, this is this should be an own string. And to string is just, hey, this is a string. I want to turn it into a string, so it can be confusing. So it's up to you what you use, but they basically do the same thing. They just implement different traits. Or you can use format exclamation mark, which is like print line, except instead of printing a line, you just get a formatted string in return. So all of these become strings. Um, as with other languages, the scopes work that if we create a variable inside of this scope, S2 is a string. I like memory. You can change, change it by pushing into the string. And we can use it. And outside of the scope, we can no longer use it. So here we can. Here we can no longer use S2. So yeah. And then we have the basic rule of ownership that we looked at earlier. Uh, we create a string here. Uh, let name equals a string from Mariusz. We assign name to name two, which we now know that uh, actually moves it. And will this work given the rules of ownership? Uh, we already answered that. So it will not work since we are trying to use both name and name two. And uh, name two is the only valid variable at this point because it's the only owner of this value. And it's only allowed to be one owner at a time. So we're going to get an error. If we wanted it to work and we wanted to have two values, we can clone, which is going to require another allocation of space and the copying over. So it's it's advisable to not clone unless you have to, because it can be slow on bigger strings or bigger vectors, bigger collections. So let's comment that out again. And here we see that we can actually clone it as well. So and if we look at string or the stir type, we have a string literal here, Bob. Name is of type reference to stir. We can take name to and assign it. And as we see, it does not care here. It just says, I am Bob and Bob. So it works just fine. 
Um, next, we're going to look a little bit about borrowings. So before we move forward here, we're going to take a look at, at that. So let's go to our draft file again. I'm going to make some space for us. And get rid of nothing. This. So say we want this to actually work in a different way. Say we want the string two to be assigned to string, but we don't want to uh, we don't want to clone it since that's kind of an expensive operation and we don't need two copies of the string hello world. But we can't do this because then we will steal the take the value from string into string two, and then we can no longer use string. Uh, and that's where we have the concept of borrowing and references. So just like uh, that, we can add an ampersand in front of the variable. And that means we're now taking a reference to string. Or another way of saying it is we are borrowing the value string. So string two now is borrowing this value from string. Uh, and we want, which means we don't own it. So the rule of having only one owner of the value is still being enforced. Uh, we now see that uh, it works as expected. So we can now use both string and string two. And this is a reference to the string. Um, we can create another one if we want. String three can be a reference as well. That's fine. We can have as many immutable references uh, as we like. So as you know, um, everything in Rust is immutable by default. So all of these variables are immutable. We can make it mutable by adding mute in front of it. Uh, and now string can be changed. So if we wanted to, we could, for example, go string dot push string. Hello world. Goodbye world. And if we were to print it now, it would say hello world, goodbye world for all of these. So we can change it if it's mutable. Uh, references or works the same way. We can borrow a value immutably with just like this, or we can borrow a mutable reference by adding mute after re the ref ampersand. This means we can now change the value of string through this uh, borrowed value string two. So we can try that. So we take string two as a mutable reference and say string to dot per string goodbye. Did I forget something? Yeah. Exactly, I wasn't going to go get this right yet. So this stuff is actually going to bite you in the ass sometimes. Well, let's look at the functions instead and get back to that other issue because that other issue is uh, actually not very fun. So let's create a, see how this borrowing and references work with functions. So let's go back to the other file for a moment. So here I have defined three functions. Uh, string parameter takes string, takes a string, string ref parameter takes a reference to a string, and stir parameter takes a reference to a stir. Um, uh, these are quite different in how they work. Um, if we think about the rules of ownership, only one variable can own a string at any given time. So when we see that this function takes a string with nothing else, that means this function is saying, I will take your string and I will own your string. So inside of this function, whatever string we pass in here will be taken over by the function. And then when it goes to the end of the scope, it will be destroyed. So S will be dropped when it goes out here and the, it will be no longer be valid. 
So if we look at this, if we have S here, which is a string that we declare create up here, and we try to print S after we pass it to the string parameter function, uh, we get an error because uh, S has been moved into this function and been destroyed. So it's no longer valid to use it here. Thankfully, the compiler tells you about this, but it can be quite uh, shocking sometimes. So we only want to do this if we actually want to take ownership. So using a parameter like this is usually when we don't need to use the string anymore, we want to just quickly move it in and be done with it. So if, you, if you're consuming a value, we can do, we can do it like this. Uh, we could al always return a string here as well to give it back. So if we were to give S back, uh, we can say, we can say S is this, and then we can use it again, because now we're giving it to the function and then the function gives it back. Uh, but that's quite tedious to do. So we don't want to do that if we're going to use it later anyway. So that's when we have the reference to string, which will borrow it. So uh, let's go to that function. So that just takes a reference to it, and then we use it again afterwards. And then that's fine because we never actually change ownership here. The owner is still this variable up here, which will go out of scope at the end of main. And this function exists throughout that period. So we can just send it a reference and we can use it later. And that's fine. Um, however, sometimes we want to pass string literals to a function. So we, here we couldn't, for example, say, yeah, just some random words. We cannot do that since this is not a reference to a string unless we have called to own then actually allocated it as well and took a reference to that value, in which case we could do it. Uh, but that's kind of syntax gore when we want to just pass. Okay, let's, um, I just had a question. I will, I will answer that in just a second. So uh, I will just do this one first. Uh, so what we can do is for functions, this is uh, we when we just want to borrow something to look at it, it should be preferred to use a reference tester since then we can use call this function. We can call it both with a literal and we can call it with strings by with the, exactly the same syntax since the string has a it implements something that allows us to dereference it into a, just a reference tester. So by doing this, we can actually call, uh, we can actually look at the, both string literals and the regular string with just one function signature instead of having both. So yeah, if we look at the, the question is, the question is when consuming, can you change the mutability as well? So let's just do that as an example. Um, oops. Um, so I want to also return it in this case, just so we can actually use it afterwards. String parameter, we want to just do string as well. Uh, yeah, so if we take a string here, we can not do this because S is immutable by default and we're taking it. So if we say that this is immutable, uh, it should be there. Yeah, there it is. So if we say that this is immutable S, then we can take it in as immutable. Uh, then we can take ownership and make it mutable within this context. And we want to return it, which means when we get it back, it will have changed. So here we get um, parameter with two parameters and lots of love. And then we push in the function, we push uh, this to it. So then with two parameters and lots of love this. 
So yeah, you can you can make it mutable inside of the function when you steal it. Um, finally, uh, let's look at calling all of these functions in succession. This is another interesting thing. So right now that works fine. We take a string ref parameters, we call the stir with this one, and then we call the stir with that one. And finally, we call the string that consumes it. If I move this function before the other one, uh, it no longer compiles since s is taken ownership of here and destroyed it no longer works here so order function call order uh, matters in this case since here we know we're not going to use it anymore after this we can uh, we can just call it here but we cannot call it before because then it's still going to be used and now the ownership is in here um, likewise, so if we're going to do the uh, answer of mutability as well, we can also take a mutable reference here, which allows us to push, push uh, or change the string inside of this function as well. So if you want to take a function that alters the string, then you should take a mutable reference to it. And then up here, you would also have to take a mutable but then you can't actually take a mutable references, reference to it because S is not mutable. So then you also have to make this mutable. So if you want to pass a mutable reference, then the val this variable also has to be mutable. But uh, this context. So let's undo that. So, uh, now that we've done that, let's look at some more borrowing rules. Uh, you cannot have immutable and mutable references at the same time. You can have unlimited immutable references only. So if you only have immut immutable references, you can have unlimited of them. And you can at any time have at most one immutable references. So all of these basically means that you can either have as many immutable references as you want, or at just one mutable reference. You cannot have a combination of the two. And for heap types that we like string, vector, box, uh, default assignment moves instead of copies, but we already looked at that. And same with the stack based type with copy, they can be assigned and then reused later. So if we go back, let's take a look at an example where we have unlimited or mutable references. So uh, here we have a mutable string S, which is called good stuff. And then we create two references, SREF and SREF2, that both refer to that one. That's similar to what we did in here uh, a bit earlier. And as we shall see, uh, not unexpected, we have two immutable references. Mm -hmm. That works fine. We can have as many as we like. We can create 10, we can create 100, doesn't matter. Uh, then we have bad stuff where we have one immutable reference, another immutable reference, and then one mutable reference. If we are going to print this, uh, it does not allow you to do so because you cannot borrow S2 mutably at the same time as it's also borrowed immutably. Um, so here we see that because we have two immutable references and then create a mutable reference, these guarantees of immutability can no longer be guaranteed by the compiler. So when the compiler cannot guarantee uh, that it's safe to take this reference, uh, it will give you errors like this. So since we have two immutable values, then a mut mutable reference, and then we're going to use the values, we can, cannot guarantee from a compiler perspective that this mutable reference did cha change those values um, between here and here. For example, S2 ref3 could have pushed to the string here and done some things, 
the compiler can't guarantee it, especially if this is happening across function calls and stuff. Um, based on that and that order matters, do you have a suggestion that could actually fix this, even if it sounds weird? Um, well, this is actually a little bit, little bit interesting. It's going to be a bit mind. Uh, yeah, it's going to, it's going to be uh, interesting. So we can take this one and move it after the print statement, and then simply just not use that since it's obviously not defined yet. And now the code works. Even if we have two immutable references and then a mutable reference, uh, since for the rest of the function, we don't use the immutable references, it's okay to have a mutable reference here because we don't use, we don't use these values anymore. We don't use s2ref or s2ref2, but they are, they are only used here. And since they're not used later, then we don't care if this one changes it because these are still immutable in the context which they're used. Not, nothing could have changed between their declaration and their use. So we can use s2ref and s2ref2 as much as we like here. But after we also have a mutable reference in scope, we can no longer use them. So it wouldn't matter even if we scope this, since then this scope could have changed it. Now, the other thing that's funny, we can also move the mutable reference before the mutable references are created, since um, now they, since the mutable reference isn't being used after here, these two guys uh, can now refer to anything that has changed since then. So, but the only th the thing we're not allowed to do is is to use the mutable reference uh, before the last use of the immutable ones. So uh, this is going to get you a lot of error messages probably. It's going to take some use to get used to it. But uh, in the end, all it, the compiler is trying to do is to enforce that this immutable reference doesn't change for as long as you use it. Um, and likewise, so, so as long as the last use of the mutable reference is before the creation of the mutable one, you, it's, it's fine. But the general rule is that you can't have uh, an immutable and immutable borrow at the same time. And finally, um, there's a slight subtle use case uh, related to that that can bite you a lot so we have now a mutable ref string i will murder your brains because it will and then we have some reference which is an immutable reference to this and then we just call a member function for string and we print it uh, which is not allowed this is more subtle, but it's basically the same thing happening. Per string is a mutable fu member function of string. So I don't know if you see what's in here, but this, mem this function on the type string takes a mutable reference to itself. So when you call this function, you are actually indirectly taking a mutable reference to the string after the declaration of the immutable reference, which means you actually borrow both a mutable and an immutable reference at the same time when you call a member function. And that's going to be interesting when you create your own structs and types at some point, because you're going to create member functions. And uh, then when you have a reference and you also call a member function on it, that's mutable, you can get some clashes here. So this can bite you, especially with bigger, more complex programs. 
uh, this is some things that gonna require to rewrite things and think differently. So I'm going to do a quick example with that as well. Mm. Let's create a new file. No. So if we just have a age uh, and uh, let's see, say max age. Then if we created our own function, that's um, add age that takes a mutable reference to self. So basically the struct operates on itself and it has to change a value. And it goes self to age plus equals a delta. So, so we create a user where the age is zero and the max age is 90. Then we say, well, we want h to be a reference to user. And then we're going to want to call user.addH2. So this is the same. This is the same issue, basically, within the context of your own structs. Well, actually, now it's fine because we never use this reference. So again, now it's fine because you don't use it. But if we wanted to use if we suddenly wanted to use it, then then we have a mutable borrow here, but then the mutable one here. So uh, this is in terms of your own structs. Uh, and second, let's look at just how structs interact with, uh, with copying and uh, moving. So if we have a user here and say user two equals user, uh, and then we want to print both of them. Uh, this would not work. So we actually have to do the call question first to get the correct error message. Uh, since now user has been moved into user two, and this contradicts what we looked at looked at earlier, where user data is definitely stored on the stack. It's just a value, and all of its internal types are also uh, do not implement drop, so there none of the internal values are on the heap. So technically, this should be a copy by default. But when you use uh, your own structs, uh, they don't actually implement the copy or the clone trait. So we can't call clone on it since it doesn't have clone. Um, so on your own structs, uh, you can use the, the derive macro like we do with debug to make it uh, so debug basically means that we can format with a colon question mark and then we get it printed out so um, uh, so we can just print the struct likewise you can do other derives here so if we say that we want to derive from clone this basically makes it so rust does a default implementation of the clone trait for you so now by doing saying that, we can now now clone our struct, which means we can now get what we expect. So you see that the debug macro, the derive macro, uh, combined with this formatting syntax means that we print the structs values just just like that. So that's what it does. And clone now lets us also call dot clone on it. And then finally, we can also do it to copy which means we can now, which means now that the, def the default assignment will be copying. So if you want your structs or enums for that matter to be able to be copied like this, uh, you have to implement this. So 
So you can ask like why, what's the reason you have to add this and not have it be consistent with other, uh, other stack types. Uh, and the reason is uh, that uh, in some cases you actually might not want this and there's no way to get rid of it. Um, also using the derived macro for this means that Rust has to generate code that does this. So if we wanted to not have clone be automatically implemented, we would have to say implement clone for our user data and we'd have to do it ourselves and say, okay, we want to produce self with self like age is self dot age and max age is self dot max age. So when you use the derived macro, Rust basically creates this for you. It's just a clone, memberwise clone and copy. So, so more code means uh, bigger executables. It means compile times increase. So it's so with Rust basically you have to build up features instead of taking opting out of them. So you just pay for what you want. So if you don't want your type to be cloned, you will actually not have code for that and you don't need to worry about it. But if you want it, you can specify it very clearly. And it will be automatically implemented in, in this case. Copy is a similar thing, so and and debug. Um, yeah, so that's um, that's in terms of structs. Uh, I see we're running short on time, and I'm, I don't think we're gonna do a break just to make sure we get through everything. We'll rather just finish early. So we're going to quickly look at slices, which is related to uh, borrowing. Uh, so slices are a view into a collection. A uh, string is also a collection of uh, characters, uh, although in Rust's uh, strings natively use UTF-8. So some characters are actually multiple bytes, um, like Japanese or Korean letters, for example, would be uh, multiple bytes. So you can't just index those with string uh, index five, for example, because that character might actually take multiple bytes, but that's a different story. Something went wrong. So slices are tied to the lifetime of the owner. So the Rust compiler can use uh, the borrow checker or the reference checker that's uh, built in to see, make sure that your slices are still valid. And it's a lot better than working with indices, especially in, for example, in return values, because uh, indices cannot be validated that they still refer to a valid index, but a slice can be. So while well, that's the end of the presentation, we're going to do an example on that. So. Uh, yeah, so sometimes uh, you can, so here's the thing. Um, you cannot only ever, you can't ever just derive copy. So if you have copy, you must also have clone, basically. That's one thing. But you can have clone without copy. And the, oh, the reason you would want that is if you don't want to accidentally make copies of things when you wanted them to be moved. But you still want to be able to clone something. So now the compiler will actually tell you, hey, we can't copy this thing. Are you sure you wanted to do that? In which case you can call clone and it's going to be very explicit that, hey, I'm actually taking a copy here. So if you want to be more explicit about where your copies are created, uh, you, could, you could skip or omit copy. But for copy to work, you also must implement clone. So in the same way that the drop trait cannot be there at the same time as copy, um, then the clone cannot be there, copy cannot be there without clones. So. Yeah, copy, copy is basically override makes that this assignment is a copy instead. This assignment. This assignment becomes a copy instead of a move. So, but you can't do that with a heap type. So if, if we put the box in here, like some box, which is heap memory, then copy 
then it's not gonna work because you can't implement copy for any type that implements drop and box implements drop. So anything that's on the heap, we cannot have copy, but we can have close. Yeah, so let's look at slices. Let's create a new file. Slices. Um, so if we create a string, like s equals, let's use the other syntax now. I have three words. So we have a string s, which has, well, it actually has four words. Okay. Um, and if we wanted to pass, let's also create a vector, let v equals. And here I'm gonna use the vector macro to create a vector of the values. So this is a vector with these values. Uh, so it's a vector i32. So the syntax for a slice, let's just create a function first. It takes a slice. So we could create a function that says um, multiply vector. Uh, so we would take a vector, which would be a mutable vec i32. So this is a mutable reference to a vector of i32s. And then we would be take a factor, which would be an i32 in this case. So this will multiply every value in the vector with this factor. And then we can for Now I am actually confused. Let's not. Some of this stuff uh, still takes a while to get your head around. Um, let's just do it the other way though. So we can print before, after v and multiply vector with v ten. I probably want to do that separately. We have to make a bit of. This is what happens when you do examples on the fly. Well, now we're actually not doing anything, but but yes, that's that's okay. The point is we're going to look at uh, slices anyway. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's why. Okay. Yeah. Um, so since this is a reference here and uh, we actually have to dereference it to get the value, um, that uh, uh, happens with value types at least. Um, if it's a string that's on the on the heap, it does it automatically. But uh, since this is just a, a scalar type uh, to multiply it, we actually have to dereference it into its actual value. So, but now we have the before and after, and it's working. So. Let's, let's get on to the slides. So now when we take a mutable reference to a vector here, uh, we actually take a reference to the whole vector and we loop through the whole vector. So what if we only wanted to multiply the middle values? So here's where we could have used the slice to just borrow parts of it. Uh, and the syntax for that is instead of specifying vec i32, it's a bracket with i32 inside of it. So if we just run it like this, uh, it works exactly the same. So this is a bit like uh, the difference that we saw in the string, string function, as in taking a reference to a string versus taking a reference to a stir. So this type is actually the type for a slice to a string. So uh, that's why when we, that's why this, this value is mostly allocated in the data space of the executable. So I mentioned that this is going to be in the data space. But whenever we use stir like this, uh, when we call it with uh, when we call it with a string, then it's actually on the heap. So this type actually is a string slice type and not just a string literal. So this can actually also refer to heap values if we pass in a string. So so this is the syntax for a string slice. But for all other types, uh, the slice syntax is reference and then brackets. So it can either be mutable or immutable. Uh, so for the vector, we now have a slice to any uh, I32 uh, containing a sequence of numbers. So what we could do here, instead of, instead of passing just one, we could pass V dot dot two. This would pass the first two values in the vector. So now we see we only multiplied the first two values. Six, three to six. Now we multiply only the middle values. Or we could do uh, dot dot six, which or six dot dot, which takes everything from the sixth index and on onwards. So these three. Uh, and that's, uh, so that's the power of slices. We can now pass the entire thing. Uh, can I do five to two? I mean, I never tried. Uh, no, you cannot. So it's, it's not like Python where you can do minus two and do be creative like that, but you can, but you can also do dot dot, which is the same as doing the entire thing. So that's the entire value. Um, if so, as we noticed, when we do zero, three, it's uh, zero, one, and two. So it's so three, index number three is uh, non inclusive, whereas the first one is inclusive. So, so technically, here we could also do v dot len, and that would also do the entire vector, I think. No, because we are borrowing it twice. So hey, that's funny. Again, uh, since we're borrowing v immutably here, we also borrow v immutably when we call the length function. And that we can, you can't borrow both at the same time. So we can't actually do this unless we specifically say do it on a separate line, because then we don't borrow it at the same time. So. Uh, that's that's an example of where you have to rethink how you write your code. Since here we borrow immutably and here we borrow immutably. Uh, another thing here is if you put equals in front of the three, then this also becomes inclusive and you go from index zero to index three inclusive. So if you do that, then you also include the third. So zero, one, two, three. And 
let's do this same thing with the string. So let's do it somewhere where we return. So first odd num uh, number in a, here we don't need it to be mutable. So we can just do a i32 and we will return a slice to i32. Well, here we can just return a regular reference, I guess. So what we're going to do is for uh, value again in P, if value um, Yeah, um, so in case there's no odd, uh, we actually have to return something even, even in that case. I know we haven't talked about this yet, but I'm just gonna have to do this for the sake of the example. That's the wrong one. So if we want to get the first actually odd number, and we suddenly change our vector to consist of two, six, four, five, then we should get a reference to five in this case. So we can call first odd number, passing the entire vector and say, let first equals, and we want to print first odd. And then we find five. So here we can also pass in the slice like we did. So we can pass in the first, first four. And when we get five, if we pass in the first three, uh, we get a crash because there are no odd numbers and we're not handling the error. So. And this could also be, if we want to do the first odd number out, then we could also return a slice here. So reference to a slice, and then we would do, uh, but then we don't have enough information here. So we will have to go also get an in, to enumerate here. So we get the index. So we loop through using, we get an iterator to the, vet, to the slice and we call, And then we can return V from the current index and out. And we need a reference to that. Did I let's see? Right, I didn't change the calling name. Let me do this. And then we say, okay, so from the first odd number and out, we have five, six, seven, eight, nine. So what's nice about returning this slice is that uh, since our vector is mutable, we could go v.clear here, which means the slice would no longer be valid since this is a reference to the vector, a uh, part of the vector. And here we clear the vector and then we try to use the value. Rust now tells you that, hey, um, here is an immutable borrow of this value. So you're immutably borrowing uh, like part of this vector, which is a slice. And then we clear it, which is a mutable borrow. Since we're doing both an immutable and a mutable at the same time, Rust says, hey, that's not allowed because then we cannot guarantee this one anymore, which means when you use slices like this in combination, with the borrow checker, you can actually guarantee that as long as this view into the vector, whether it's just the two first values, the middle values, or the last values, it's always going to be valid as long as it compiles, right? So again, we could use what we learned earlier and just clear after the last use of the mutable one. It would work. Uh, we can clear it before we assign it. It will work, but also crash because there are no longer any odd numbers and we don't handle the error. We're going to look at error handling later. And uh, so, yeah, that's a little bit 
of a look on a slice. So if we instead return the, the index here, so the index of the value instead of the slice, then this would still compile. Because then say, say this was an index, then we would do V of first. Rust could no longer guarantee that this is safe because the index would not have any relation whatsoever to the vector. It would just be an integer. And then it can't check. So, but it can validate the slice because then it just uses the borrow rules. And yeah, that's that's the basic introduction. Um, you should also go read the chapter in the Rust book, I think. I think that's part of everything. Yeah, it covers mostly everything and uh, with a bit more details, but I hope these examples also help to clear things out. So if there are any questions, you can, uh, you have two minutes right now. I hope it was mostly understandable. It's a bit of a complex topic that takes a bit of just using Rust to get into. And it will very likely give you every single one of you at least one compile error throughout uh, your relationship with Rust. You're going to get lots of compiler errors. Yes. <laughs> You're going to argue with the borrow checker all the time. Yeah. It, it's useful when you are um, writing implementations for your structs that every time you don't need to, to have mutable self, don't do mutable self, uh, just do self. If you're just calculating stuff or doing something immutably, don't like over mute stuff because then it bites you. Um, but yeah, you, you're gonna work. It, it kind of annoys me that you sometimes need to rewrite your code add, adding by adding additional variables because you cannot just inline things like in some other languages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes you also need to put additional scope. So you will kind of use the curly braces more <laughs> than in other languages just to restrict the scope of certain things such that the borrow checker doesn't argue with you yeah yeah i will put this on github uh, with all the files we just did yeah sounds great and i will put the link to the slides as well on the wiki Any questions, guys? No, no questions. Yeah, looking forward to errors. <laughs> that sounds sounds like it. Good, good attitude. All right. So thank you very much, uh, Carl. Um, I'm gonna stop recording.